Travels of Marco Polo, Book 2, Chapter 39, How Prester John Treated the Golden King. When they reached the court of Prester John, he ordered his prisoner clothed in the meanest apparel, and to humiliate him further, set him to looking after his cattle. In this wretched condition he remained for two years, strict care being taken that he should not escape. And the end of that period, the Golden King was brought before Prester John again, trembling from fear that he would put him to death. But, on the contrary, Prester John, after a severe rebuke and a warning against pride and arrogance, pardoned him. He then directed that he should be dressed in royal apparel and sent back to his principality with an escort of honor. From that time forward, he remained loyal and lived on friendly terms with Prester John. The foregoing is what I was told about the Golden King. Chapter 40 of A Large and Noble River, the Kara Moran Upon leaving the fortress, upon leaving the fortress of Taijin and coming about 25 miles, the traveler comes to a river called Kara Moran, a Mongol name for the Yellow River, which is of such width and depth that no solid bridge can be built to cross it. Its waters flow into the ocean. On its banks are many cities and castles inhabited by people who carry on an extensive commerce. The country bordering upon it produces ginger and also silk in large quantities. The multitude of birds is incredible, especially of pheasants, which are sold at the rate of three or the value of a Venetian groat. Here, too, grows a species of large cane in infinite abundance, some of it a foot and others a foot and a half in circumference. These are employed by the inhabitants for a variety of useful purposes. Having crossed this river and traveled three days' journey, you arrive at a city named Kachan Fu, whose inhabitants are idolaters. They carry on a considerable trade and make a variety of articles. The country produces much silk, ginger, and many drugs that are nearly unknown in our part of the world. They also weave gold tissues, as well as every other kind of silk and cloth. We shall speak next of the noble celebrated city of Kenzan Fu, in the kingdom of the same name. Chapter 41 of the City of Kanzan Fu. Departing from Kachen Fu, and proceeding eight days' journey in a westerly direction, you continually meet with cities and commercial centers, and pass many gardens and cultivated grounds, with an abundance of the mulberry tree which produces silk. The inhabitants in general worship idols, but there are also found here Nestorian Christians, Turkomans, and Saracens. The wild beasts of the country afford excellent sport, and a variety of birds are also taken. At the end of eight days, you arrive at the city of Kanzan Fu, which was anciently the capital of an extensive, noble, and powerful kingdom, the seat of many noble descended kings. At present, it is governed by Mangalai, the son of the Great Khan. It is a center for commerce and famous for its manufactures. Raw silk is produced in large quantities, and tissues of gold and every kind of silk are woven here. They also prepare every article necessary for the equipment of an army. All provisions are abundant and moderately priced. The inhabitants in general worship idols, but there are some Christians, Turkomans, and Saracens. In a plain about five miles from the city stands a beautiful palace belonging to King Mangalai, embellished with many fountains and rivulets both inside and outside the buildings. There is also a fine park surrounded by a high wall with battlements enclosing an area of five miles where all kinds of wild animals, both beasts and birds, are kept for sport. In its center is this spacious palace which cannot be surpassed for symmetry and beauty. It contains many marble halls and chambers, ornamented with paintings, beaten gold, and the finest azure. Mangalai, pursuing the footsteps of his father, governs his principality with strict justice and is beloved by his people. He also takes much delight in hunting and hawking. Chapter 42 of the Boundaries of Cathay and Manzi Traveling westward three days from the residence of Mangalai, you still find towns and castles whose inhabitants subsist by commerce and manufactures, and where there is an abundance of silk. At the end of these three days, you enter a region of mountains and valleys which lie within the province of Hanshung. The inhabitants of this tract are worshippers of idols and cultivate the earth. They live also by the chase, the land being covered with woods that harbor many wild beasts, such as tigers, bears, lynxes, fallow deer, antelopes, and stags, which the people turn to good account. This region extends for a distance of 20 days' journey, the way lying entirely over mountains, and through valleys and woods, but with towns where travelers may find convenient accommodations. Chapter 43 Concerning the Province of Manzi After this journey of 20 days towards the west, you will arrive at a place called Ahba Luch Manzi, which signifies the white city on the Manzi border where the country becomes level and is very populous. The inhabitants live by trade and handicrafts. Large quantities of ginger are produced here, and this is conveyed through all province of Cathay, with great profit to the merchants. The country yields wheat, rice, and other grain, plentiful and at little cost. This plain, thickly covered with villages, continues for two stages, after which you come to high mountains, valleys, and forests. Traveling 20 days still farther to the west, you continue to find the country inhabited by people who worship idols and subsist upon the fruits of the soil as well as of the chase. Here also, besides the wild animals already enumerated, there are great numbers of species of animal which produce musk. Chapter 44 of the province of Sindinfu. 
Having traveled those 20 stages through a mountainous country, you reach a plain on the borders of Manzi. Here, there is a district named Sindin Fu, which is also the name of his capital. A larger noble city, formerly the seat of many rich and powerful kings. The circumference of the city is 20 miles, but at present is divided in the following manner. The late king had three sons, and it being his wish that each of them should reign after his death, he divided the city among them, separating the parts by walls, although the whole continued to be surrounded by one general enclosure. These three brothers accordingly became kings, and each had a considerable tract of streams, which, descending from distant mountains, flow around and pass through it in a variety of directions. These rivers range from half a mile in width to 200 paces, and are very deep. A great bridge crosses one of these rivers within the city. It has on each side a row of marble pillars which support a roof constructed of wood, ornamented with paintings of a red color, and covered with tiles. Throughout the whole length, also, there are neat compartments and shops, where all sorts of trades are carried on. One of the buildings, larger than the rest, is occupied by the officers who collect duties and a toll from those who pass over the bridge. From the bridge, it is said His Majesty receives daily the sum of a hundred bezants of gold. These rivers, uniting below the city, contribute to form the mighty river called the Kiang, the Yangtze Kiang, whose course, before it empties into the ocean, amounts to a hundred days' journey. On these rivers and in the vicinity, there are many towns and fortified places, and numerous vessels in which large quantities of merchandise are transported to and from the city. The people of the province are idolaters. Departing thence, you travel five days, partially along the plain and partially through valleys, where you see many fine mansions, castles, and small towns. The inhabitants live by agriculture. In the city, there are factories, particularly of very fine clothes, and crepes and gauzes. This country, like the districts already mentioned, is infested with lions, bears, and other wild animals. At the end of these five days' journey, you reach the desolate country of Tibet.